Um, well, sickle cell disease is basically a genetic uh, blood disorder. Okay. Um, and it affects your red blood cells, basically meaning that the hemoglobin that gives my red blood cells life is lacking, um, or it's basically defective. I hate to use that word, but okay. that's basically what it is. So the lifespan of my red blood cells mm -hmm. is shortened. Um, which can cause the actual red blood cell itself to sickle. And that's where the name of the disease came, comes from. Because it's a shape, correct? Yes, okay. like, um, like farmers used out right. crops, they mm -hmm. use sickles to, to cut it. So it basically looks like a crescent moon, pretty much. Got it. Um, but it just means that because of the shape of my red blood cells, mm -hmm. that they will get stuck in arteries or blood vessels like, causing pain. So those pain crises, those episodes, what they refer to medically, mm -hmm. um, can happen anywhere that blood flows. So in the face, the lungs, okay. any organ, um, joints, your feet, your hands, basically anywhere. How old were you when you were diagnosed? Um, my parents didn't know that I had sickle cell disease until I was an infant. I was pretty young. Okay. Um, my dad noticed that I wasn't um, eating properly. I wasn't okay. developing like most infants my age, and he was noticing that something just wasn't right. So um, they took me to the doctor and they did some tests, and then that's when they found out that I had sickle cell disease. Okay. And so I just learned something. I didn't know that infants could be affected by sickle cell. I thought that it was a disease that occurred later in adulthood. Even well, technically, um, the only way for you to get sickle cell disease is through the bloodline. So my okay. mother has sickle cell trait, okay. and my father has sickle cell trait. Okay. I'm the oldest of the two children, okay. and out of those chances, I was born with the disease. So let's say that you have trait, mm -hmm. and a guy you're dating will use Tony. Okay. He has trait, but you all didn't get screened, you didn't mm -hmm. get sickle cell um, screened or tested, Okay. and you have three children, and two of your three children have the disease. Okay. So it's not necessarily something that occurs later on in life, it's something that you're born with and you deal with until you're no longer here. Got it. Okay, mm -hmm. so who does it affect primarily? Um, I'll tell you something I did not know. Mm -hmm. I learned that Trick Daddy has sickle cell. Is it sickle cell? Does he have sickle cell? Is lupus a... Lupus is not a type, type of, of sickle, sickle cell. cell. Okay. Lupus is something completely, completely different. Yes. Okay. I um, I saw someone trying to explain lupus and by him being a male having lupus and how it's rare mm -hmm. and somehow sickle cell was tied into this. I want to clear that misconception that the two are not related mutual, at all. mutually exclusive. exclusive of each yes. Other. Okay. So, but who does it primarily affect? Um, it can affect anybody. Okay. Um, it is literally a genetic disease. So it depends on what runs in your bloodline can affect you later. Just like cancer can, right. or high blood pressure, mm -hmm. or diabetes. Okay. It's all genetic. So it affects people worldwide. There's a large population in the Philippines with sickle cell disease. Okay. There's a large population in Africa with the disease. There's a large population um, in the Middle East that has sickle cell disease, so it doesn't just affect people with a certain skin color. Okay. It's technically just related about your blood. Male and female. Male and female, yes. Got it. So, what does your support system look like? Do you need a great deal of support? So, I've been knowing yes. you since middle school. <laughs> yeah. I've never seen you live um, a life that anyone else had not lived, you know. Right. So, how does it affect your daily life? What does your support system look like? Um, my parents really tried to make sure that I had a normal life, and I hate using the word normal because mm -hmm. we all have different experiences with life, different exposures to certain things. Um, but they really wanted me to live the best way I could in spite of having sickle cell mm -hmm. disease. So as far as my support system, it's always been a very strong support system from my family. My mother has always been the person who was always by my side whenever I was sick or whenever I had a crisis or so whenever person. sickle cell was mm -hmm. always there trying to beat me down. She has always been there and I thank God for her. But family has really been a very strong
strong support for me um, as well as friends. I have people in my life who have chosen to stick by my side mm -hmm. in spite of me having this ugly disease, in spite of it being so sporadic and ruining my plans mm -hmm. or changing my mood. They have decided to just stick by me in spite of that. So a support system is definitely needed when you're dealing with this disease. Um, I think it's important also to have that relationship with a medical team. You okay. need a great hematology doctor, you need okay. a great PCP, and they need to have that relationship of being able to talk to each other about Absolutely. you as the patient. Because without that relationship, without that circle of trust, things can go awry really quickly. Okay. Because if I'm out of town somewhere, or if I'm traveling and I need to go to the emergency room, mm -hmm. I need to know that my circle of trust is gonna be there to support me because I may not get the same care there right. that I can get here in Memphis. Got it. So continuity of care in regards to medical, who your medical professionals are, yes. is very important. Very and important. that makes sense. And you were talking about your mom, and you said that your mom has sickle cell as well. So I'm pretty sure she has trait. My parents has a trait. Mm -hmm. Okay. So did your mom or did your parents have any education prior to you? They had no clue whatsoever. Okay. Um, when they discovered that I had the disease, all three of us were learning. Okay. Um, so there were a lot of moments where they were afraid that something would happen, so I wasn't allowed to do something. Mm -hmm. I remember being in elementary school and wanting to join Girl Scouts and mm -hmm. to be on the cheerleading team, and they were just like, well, you know, you can't do that. Your sick is unconnected. So I was restricted from doing so many things okay. growing up. Mm -hmm. They wanted me to live as normally as I could, but I was always in and out of the hospital. Like, from elementary to middle school, it was always... Mm -hmm. Hospital, emergency room, calling the doctor. So mm -hmm. they were, I think, more afraid of something happening to me. Right. So they really didn't want me to be out and about mm -hmm. like most children. So, and I'm pretty sure they were figuring it out as they went. And they know? were. It was um, new to them. And they're still learning, just like I'm still learning. As I'm getting older with this disease, I know that it, it's changing. Okay. And that's something that's scary because I have SS, okay, hemoglobin SS, um, also known as sickle anemia. Okay, so it affected me differently as a child than it does now as an adult. Okay, so I'm learning how to take care of myself now compared to then. Okay. Um, and that's very hard because people my age with this disease, we're slowly falling down in the middle. So, mm -hmm. leaning on people that are older than me that have this disease is hard and it's rare. Okay. We, we do have advantages of living past the life expectancies that we had before. Okay. Um, but I'm also learning how to maneuver through life. Okay. I'm, in, I'm learning how to maneuver and still enjoy life okay. living with sickle cell. So, it's, it's a challenge. Okay. So, what does your self care routine look like? Um, do you go to the spa? Do you? You know what? I I learned as I got older that massage mm -hmm. is something that really helps me. Okay. And I know that probably sounds like I don't know. It probably sounds crazy, but mm -hmm. when you think about it, massage is basically improving circulation. It's right. It's moving blood. It's mm -hmm. moving things in that area of so whenever I'm getting a massage, mm -hmm. I have to remember that it's increasing circulation. So massage definitely helps me. Essential oils help me. Okay. Um, water has always been like a big, big part mm -hmm. of my care. And as you can see, I have this huge right. bottle of water with right. me. So I mean, it's always been about hydration and eating well. Um, and I've noticed now that I can feel the difference between me consistently eating fruits and vegetables versus skipping a day or mm -hmm. going out to eat with my friends, or going to like Chick-fil-A or Popeye or something, mm -hmm. and getting something fried, and then how my body feels the next day. Oh, okay. okay, I need to like increase my- Cause vitamins. I see your brother cook up stone. And you know what? <laughs> <laughs> and you know what, he, he's a blessing. I love mm -hmm. my little brother. He mm -hmm. will fuss at me mm -hmm. about if I don't tell him about when I'm sick, and it's like, it's not that I'm trying to keep it from you, but at the moment, I'm just trying to focus on what's going on inside of me right. and fight back. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I'm trying to keep you out of the loop, mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's just that in the moment, I'm focusing I'm, on myself. I'm focusing and on right. me and what's yeah. going on. And at the same time, I also don't want to be a burden to my family and friends. Mm-hmm. So it's consistently. And you know, you don't feel like a burden to your family, right? And you know what? As much as they say that, as much as they say we love you, we support you, we're going to be there forever, mm-hmm. whenever you need it. Oftentimes, when I need help, they're the first people that I call. Right. And they're living their lives. They're working. They're saving money. Mm-hmm. They're going on trips. They're trying to improve on what they're doing. And I don't, I don't want to be a hindrance to that. So a lot of times, people in the sickle cell community, we often feel... What's the word I'm looking for? We, we often feel like when we ask for help, it's too much. Um, and it's not that we don't think we deserve the help because if I'm asking for it, I'm at my last leg. I'm, okay. I'm at the point where I know I need the help, that's why I'm asking. So mm-hmm. I'm depending on you, but I've been depending on you for so long. Mm-hmm. And you don't want that to turn into them feeling like they're being taken advantage of. I can understand that. So oftentimes we do feel like we are a burden. Um, so I try to handle things by myself, but when it gets to the point where I'm like, I can't do it by myself, I, I will call them. Okay. All right. So I saw an interview a while back with t Boss, and she was saying how she was reluctant to have children because she was afraid to pass on that trait to, um, to her child. Do you have that same fear? Have you ever considered that same um, thought? I know regardless of any children I have, they're going to have trait just because I have disease. Um, but I do make it a point to make sure that whoever I'm building a family with does not have trait. Because if I have the disease and he has trait, our children will automatically have the disease. Okay. And I will not put any of my future children through the pain that I've gone through. And I've made post on it on Facebook and people have gotten upset or they've taken what I said and twisted it and it's not so much that I disagree with their choices Mm -hmm. but I'm saying me Tabitha will not have her children go through the same things that she went through I can understand that and I would think that others would understand that but there's certain people in the community who Mm -hmm. are dealing with that they have children with the disease and they don't regret their children they love them Mm -hmm. they don't regret falling in love with someone who had the trait or disease right and I guess they may have felt like what I said was an attack to them and that's not what it was at all okay um I basically said that I can't put someone else in my shoes going through that pain going through that suffering going through those emotions and that turmoil knowing full well that i can prevent it so no i and that you would think that would be a selfless and you know what i said that if you make those choices that that's selfish because you're not thinking about yourself you're not thinking about what you have to do later to prevent your child from going through the same things that you're going through. We we already know what that pain is like. We already know what that discrimination is like, those misconceptions, the negative connotations put on the sickle cell community. Right. You would think that you would want your children to go through that as well. Right. And I said that that was selfish. And I still stand by what I say. I said what I said. 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 Right. So, yeah, it, it gets crazy, but um, I've always made it known. Even when I was younger, I knew I wanted to have a family. I knew I wanted a big family. Okay. Um, and I also want to adopt. So whoever my future mate is, they have to be down for that. Um, I've always been really sure about that. I, I don't want my children to go through what I'm going through, but they're, they're automatically going to have traits. Have traits. Have disease. Okay. But yeah, it, it's scary because you don't want to continue this cycle of pain and then there's so many doctors out there that tell us oh well you can't have kids you shouldn't have children you shouldn't even think about it Mm -hmm. and a lot of my friends in the sickle cell community have children they have families and they're doing well so it's like i know that you're a medical professional and you're supposed to tell me what i'm doing health wise but you don't have the last say that's absolutely. not your position to tell me. Absolutely. So it can be disheartening sometimes, but I understood what T-Boss was saying. Um, she probably felt hurt and confused and mm-hmm. 
like she was doing the best she could right trying to have children because i think that's something that a majority of women want to have they want to have children they want to reproduce so when someone wants to put their hand in your decision it's like it's intrusive it is right it's very intrusive it's like until i ask you for your opinion please don't don't weigh in on something that you don't know anything about i i totally understand that um so misconceptions what's the number one misconception that you want to clear up um i think a lot of people believe that sickle cell disease is a black disease and that's not it at all like i was saying earlier it's genetic okay so if your father had high blood pressure issues that means that you need to also be aware that you can have high blood pressure issues right the same thing with an uncle or an aunt or a grandfather um, it's it's genetic. It's all about your DNA, what's in your blood. So if I have the disease, like I said, I'm gonna make sure that my mate doesn't have trait that he's completely free and clear. Um, so let's say that my parents did know that they both had trait. They probably would have made the decision to not have kids. They probably would have decided to date other people, and I respect that completely. Right. Um, that's their decision to make. But they knew nothing about sickle cell disease. They knew nothing about trait. They didn't even know that that's what was in their DNA. So right. it's it's definitely a huge misconception that I, I get so sick and tired of hearing that people believe that it's associated with skin color and it's not at all. And I, I was one of the people that thought that. So I'm glad you cleared that up. I I didn't know. And I mean, I it's, it's only because people aren't educated. Right. People aren't made aware that it's, it doesn't involve skin color at all or demographic, it, it's purely blood. Okay. <laughs> and I know people of Latina and Hispanic descent that have the disease. Like I said, I know Filipino people with the disease. Okay. I know people from Ireland with the disease. So okay. it, it doesn't matter what you look like. Okay. Just like cancer doesn't care what you look like, anyone can have cancer, anyone can have sickle cell disease. I'm glad you cleared that up. And not think, only for me, but for everyone else watching. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. I think because people are still afraid to talk about certain things, that some subjects are taboo. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we don't discuss those things enough as a people, Absolutely. as a community. We Absolutely. should be able to discuss our plans, our dreams with each other mm -hmm. and not feel judged. And I think that's one of the things that we've kind of kept taboo about diseases and blood. I think whenever those things are discussed, people automatically go, oh gosh. And it makes some people disease. uncomfortable. And right. it does, mm -hmm. it does, yeah. So, um, I appreciate you cleaning that up. Cause <laughs> I'm gonna be honest, I didn't know. I thought it primarily affected the African American community. And I'll be very honest, I thought it only affected women. So I didn't, I didn't know. Um, outside of you, I've never known anyone with sickle cell. And you know what, growing up, I didn't know anyone with it either. Okay. Um, and I only learned of other people with the disease through St. Jude and McBonner. There was a camp that they held in Kentucky. Okay. Um, and that's when I got to know and see people who looked like me, who understood the language, mm -hmm. who knew the pain that I felt. And that camp, it really saved me. It created another family. And if I hadn't gone and known these wonderful people, I would be a completely different person. I still keep in contact with those individuals. They're like family to me. So if it wasn't for those two hospitals, mm -hmm. putting together camp, letting us feel like we weren't alone, making sure that we were learning mm -hmm. about the disease and about each other, I would be a completely different person. Well, thank God for St. Jude. Listen. <laughs> thank God for St. Jude. Listen, St. Jude saves lives, and it's not just kids, it's adults too. Um, they are literally looking for cures, and looking for clinical trials, and mm -hmm. looking at medicines. So I have every faith that one day we will have a cure. Absolutely. It's, it's a beautiful thing. I, anything St. Jude does, I'm just like, <laughs> so speaking of, are you are you involved in any organizations or any foundations here in Memphis in regards to success? Um, there's a foundation here in Memphis that I'm planning to work with in the future um, with advocacy, um, and that's the 
Sickle Cell Foundation of Tennessee. Okay. Um, and also, I always go back up to St. Jude to keep in touch with those people that nice. created mm -hmm. those bonds. Um, and I also speak to the transition groups for um, Sickle Cell, the pediatric okay. transition to adult care. So I'm always doing some type of advocacy work to kind of get the word out and educate people about Sickle Cell. Anything else you want us to know? What do we need to know? Um, that's a good question. I think I really wanted to discuss the fact that it's not a black disease, that it has nothing to do with skin color. And I also wanted to address the medical community. And whenever they hear sickle cell disease, there's always an eye roll involved. Or they always associate us with drug seeking. Or they automatically really? think that we are the problem child <laughs> of the medical community. And it's all misconceptions, it's all discrimination. And I think until they learn as well that it's not just a black disease, that it's genetic, right. and that we're all human and we just want to be cared for, right. that maybe things will improve. But um, a lot of us get side glares or those looks because they automatically assume that we're drug seeking and because of the pain because of pain management yes um the pain management is probably the number one issue that we deal with because like i said earlier our red blood cells are sickle shaped and they often get stuck in arteries or veins and they can cause damage so, so they're trying to push through and they're so yes. much stuck mm -hmm. and i can imagine they can hurt Anywhere that blood flows, a, a crisis can happen. So I've had a crisis in my face. Um, I've had one in my eye. I've had one in my hip. I've had one in my knee. I've had one in my back, my stomach. So anywhere blood can flow, you can have a, a sickle cell crisis. Um, and because of that pain, because it hits you automatically out of nowhere, and because it's always generally intense, and increasing and spreading uh -huh. pain management is generally one of those things that we're concerned about and a lot of times if you've been dealing with this pain since you were two mm -hmm. of course the medication that worked at the age of two isn't going to work at the age of 20 right because your pain tolerance has changed, changed. the medications that they have given you have changed right so they're always working on something that will help manage your pain um, but there are instances where they can give you nothing that will help. And I have many friends in the community who don't have pain-free days. They're always in pain. They wake up in pain, they go to bed in pain. Um, they don't have a pain-free week. And I'm on the complete opposite of the spectrum. Okay. I probably am in the hospital maybe four times a year. Okay. And it used to be a lot less than that. So. Now that it's increasing, I'm working on changing my care. Okay. Um, so I do have pain-free days, pain-free weeks, pain-free months. Mm -hmm. And I know that that's a blessing because that's atypical of the disease. Right. Um, but when I do have pain, it's sporadic. It's out of nowhere and it increases within a minute. So I can be feeling great at 5 o'clock be getting ready for work or mm -hmm. going out with friends or mm -hmm. you know to spend some time with family and at 5 30 i'm doubling over in pain so that trip to the emergency room mm -hmm. that trip to go get help mm -hmm. they often look at us as if our pain isn't real okay as if our pain doesn't really exist um as if we're acting i suppose mm -hmm. because we look like everybody else on the outside right we're disabled, but we look fine. Right. Um, so they often look at what is on our face or what we're wearing or what we're saying mm -hmm. instead of looking at our blood work, instead of talking to our hematologist, right. instead of asking us what our plan is. And I would think that would just be formality instead of no. a lot of gauging. Times, a lot of times they will gauge if we are there or if it's serious by if we're screaming. And if I've been dealing with this pain for... I, I can tolerate it without screaming. Yeah. And a lot of times <laughs> they think if we're not acting out or if we're not doubling over in pain or acting that it's not... All right. So what type of holistic approaches do you use? Because I know you mentioned essential oils. Do you use specific oils? Um, essential oils are amazing. Um, they do help 
me personally, um, as far as relaxation and um, methods of healing myself without relying on the hospital. Um, lavender, God sin. Okay. Um, it helps to calm me, relax me, and I think that's one of the things that we deal with the most is stress because it's not only the pain that we're dealing with, it's like, oh my God, I gotta go to the hospital now, I gotta deal with these crazy doctors. Right. So we often deal with um, therapies that will distract us okay. from the pain. So a lot of times it's my phone or it's social media or it's a game or okay. it's my favorite TV show. Okay. Something like that to distract me from it. And a lot of times I think they look at that. Well, she's on her phone. She can't be in that much pain. It's like, no. I have to take myself mentally out of my body and focus it on something else. Right. So I don't say anything crazy to you because I'm in so much pain. Right. Because you don't believe that I'm in pain. Right. But lavender oil, God Okay. Frankincense, essential oil, and when it's mentioned in the Bible, I never knew that frankincense was an oil, mm -hmm. but it works for everything. I love frankincense. Um, okay. Peppermint works as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that's good for respiratory. Peppermint is. Yes. Um, chamomile works as well. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of dabble in a lot of those okay. things that will help to calm me. So yes. Got it. And I'm pretty sure the pain. Especially when you have a, a episode that, as you described, you don't see them coming. Mm -hmm. um, can come out of nowhere, you're fine, and then you're in pain. Yes. How does that affect your mental health, especially dealing with it from birth and you being in pain or having to deal with pain all of your life or ever since you can remember? How does that affect your mental health? Um, it affects it tremendously. I think that's something that the sickle cell community has to deal with on top of physical health is mental health. Um, and this disease will not only try you physically or mm -hmm. mentally, but it will also do it spiritually and psychologically. So okay. mental health is something that we as a community have to really focus on mm -hmm. and be able to talk about openly without being judged or right. being um, cool to one another. Mm -hmm. But mental health is something that I've learned that I need personally because this past weekend um, I had a crisis and the only person who was there for me was my mother and I got to a really empty place like it was dark um, because at that point I was in so much pain I didn't really want to do with anything else I was like I'm mm -hmm. done I'm finished mm -hmm. and I was, <laughs> I was crying I was sobbing I was in so much pain and my mom was like don't say that she had to literally like rock me like a thank god Lord. almost listen mm -hmm. she held me like a child and she mm -hmm. rocked me and she was like don't say that i know you're frustrated i know you're in pain mm -hmm. i know that you're tired of this you're still dealing with losing your friend but don't say that everything's gonna be okay you've done this before we can do it again and she literally built me back up so I was in a really difficult negative space because I had been dealing with pain days before. So this was the second pain crisis of the week. Okay. And they don't hit me often like that. So the fact that it did the same way, but it was mm -hmm. more intense. Right. Um, it was just really frustrating for me because after the first pain crisis, mm -hmm. I was like, I'm gonna eat well, I'm gonna hydrate, I'm gonna do this and that. I had grilled chicken and salad and water and I had vitamin water on the side. I was doing really well. I was getting rest and then boom. Wow. So that, that has to be frustrating listen, to take all the precautionary measures to ensure that you're okay and then boom you still hit with the episode and you talk yes. about like so your mental health is affected because you're in so much pain and it yes. is agonizing to have to yes. live with, with chronic pain. Yes. But grief because you mentioned that you've lost friends. Mm -hmm. um, so grief, loss, just and pain. One thing on top of the other. And at the moment, I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I, I remember very clearly um, telling God that I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. That I wasn't strong enough to continue dealing with this mm -hmm. disease. And I think at that moment, my mother came and she must have heard me I, I told her i'm done i can't do this anymore and she literally had to like build me back up because at that point i was like 
I'm done with. Oh, I think I'll be <laughs> And I forget how strong she is and how much this disease has hurt her mm -hmm. because she's not only seeing her firstborn deal with it, she's seeing her only daughter deal with it. She's right. seeing her child go through all of this and there's moments where I know she feels like she can do nothing. Right. And there are many moments where there's nothing she can do. This past Friday, Friday yeah. she was the only reason that I was like, okay, mm -hmm. I'm going to keep going. But it, it was a real eye-opening moment for me because she's always been there for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's things that I forget mm -hmm. that happened in my childhood dealing with this disease because mm -hmm. I think my body couldn't deal with it. So. Mm -hmm my body's reaction was to forget it. Mm -hmm. And she will remind me that I've been given certain things, I've had a spinal tap, and methods that they do for the same, that they would do for mm -hmm. a pregnant mother when she's getting an epidural, they've mm -hmm. done that to me to kind of give me some therapies, and I don't remember any of this. And a lot of times they say that your body's defense to block pain is to have you to forget it. Okay. And I think, that forgetting things like that has helped me because I don't remember the pain. I don't associate to it. Okay. It's like a tie that's been cut. Mm -hmm. But the pain that I experienced, I remember. I will always remember that. Okay. Because I was in a really, I was lost. Mm -hmm. It wasn't so much a dark place because I don't associate all dark things with a negative experience. Right. But I was, I was lost. I was fed up, and I was mm -hmm. at a point where I was like. I, I don't want to do this and she literally had to build me up so mentally it's very difficult not just for you but for the people that are pulling for you mm -hmm. so um, they have to be strong and they have to be okay to make sure that you're okay and it's hard because I know that they're not like I said earlier, they're living their lives. They're trying to do things for themselves. And I think that's often times where we feel like we are the burden because we're preventing them from doing things that make them happy. And there's been often times where I was sick and I'd have to call my parents. I need y'all to take it to the emergency room. I'm at my breaking point. I've been with this pain for so many hours and they have to stop what they were doing and cry and get me and take it to the hospital. So mentally, this disease, it, it will kick you. Um, so it's not just seeing that you've lost a friend through social media because you built these relationships with people. It's also dealing with the stress and agony that it's putting on you and your friends and family as well as the pain. So mental health has to be something that you strive for. Right. So you can't be afraid to ask for help, whether it's mm -hmm. to see a therapist or a counselor or to talk to someone. Right. You have to work through those feelings mm -hmm. because otherwise you're dealing with a bigger monster. Right. You're dealing with something on top of the disease that you're battling every day. And I've dealt with depression and anxiety, so yes. this disease also will add to that. So mm -hmm. mentally... Um, you have to remember that you aren't just making sure that your body is physically okay. Mm -hmm. Am I in a good place? Am I surrounding myself with positive people? Right. Am I feeling good today? Mentally, can I continue on or do I need help? So you also have to think the same thing spiritually and psychologically. Can I continue doing this, striving for better right. with this disease? Mm -hmm. And that's difficult. Right. So what is your spiritual routine? I know that we had a conversation about the church and like you, I I don't go to church. I'm okay with visiting, but I don't I don't go to church. I've always said and I know I mentioned um, to my friends over the past weekend, I feel like God communicates to me through music. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the way we speak to each other. Yes. I don't feel the need the need to go to church, but um I believe in prayer. I believe that prayer is powerful and I pray daily and I do have a spiritual routine. What does your spiritual routine look like that's outside of church? Um, I I do enjoy going to church. I was raised in the church, but right. I know that prayer doesn't always fix everything. Right. Um, and I know that as a Christian, as a 
women living in the South, we're okay. always told that, oh, just pray about it. Mm-hmm. But there's instances where I need more than prayer. I need love. I need you to talk to me. I need you to understand what I'm dealing with. I need you to actually at least pretend that you care. Understanding is key. And, and a lot of times people don't want to understand. They don't want to go out of the scope of what they're dealing with. And like I said earlier, I think that we're kind to others when people are unkind to us. So when people try to understand me or want to learn something from me, I think that's the biggest way to show love. Um, But prayer does help me. But there are moments where I know that my communication with God is more important. Mm -hmm. I should know God like I know my mother, like I know my friends. And if the church was to go away, Mm -hmm. I still need to have that relationship with him. But I also need to make sure that I'm okay outside of that spectrum. That the church, that religion can help me spiritually, but I need other things to also aid in my care here. Um, And I think that's really, for me, that relationship with my family and friends. I have people that I can call and say, I need prayer for this person dealing with that, or I need prayer for myself, and they will stop what they're doing and they will pray with me. Um, But I also know that the people who accept me for who I am, Mm -hmm. positive and negative, Mm -hmm. them being there for me helps me. Um, So those people that I call my family, Mm -hmm. they're, they're legit there for me. So they accept me for everything That's that so I nice. am. And I think everyone needs that relationship, especially if you're dealing with something chronic, um, like sickle cell or lupus or something like Support that. Support systems are yes. play a huge role They're in vital. your healing. They're vital. Mm-hmm. And there's been instances where I would get sick when I was out with friends. Mm-hmm. And they would get together and come and take care of me as a unit. Um, I was over my, my godmother's house. Mm-hmm. Was Thanksgiving last year, excuse me. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to say maybe 2016. Okay. <laughs> and I had a crisis right after we ate. I was on my way home, and I was like, "Oh my God, I don't feel good. Something's wrong. Yeah. Like everything from my shoulders down to my waist mm-hmm. started to hurt." Okay. So I was like, "Okay, can I make it home?" And I was like, "We're gonna keep pushing. We're gonna make it home." Mm-hmm. And then that pain started in my chest, and I was like, "Okay, no." I gotta turn around. So I turn around, and by the time I make it to her doorstep, I can't breathe. So she's like, what's wrong? You're having a crisis? And like, automatically, she was like, okay, where your pain is? Where's your cell phone? Where's your water? She's telling Jeremy to go to this, Jordan go to that. And she immediately starts to pray for me, and she's like trying to massage me to kind of get some type of blood flow to the area. And I, I don't know what would have happened if I tried to go home or if I tried to head to the hospital versus Mm -hmm. turning around. And they knew what to do because they want to understand. Understand. They want to know that if something happens, Mm -hmm. how do we help you? Right. So that conversation has already been had. So Mm -hmm. when the actual problem came, they knew Mm -hmm. what to do. So I, I thank God for my second family for my extended family. I thank God for them. <laughs> yeah, listen. Yeah. That was a really rough Thanksgiving and I had worked that day. I had been on my feet for probably over six hours, which is too much for me physically. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that on top of the stress and the holidays and being with family and friends, my body was just like, hey, 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 right. you're doing too much. We about to pop off. So, yeah. <laughs> It was, it was rough, but they definitely helped me more than God. So I'm appreciative of you coming and helping us understand because you educated me so much you just don't know. Yeah. And um, I hope to, if I'm ever um, in a situation, whether I'm around you or anyone else that battles with the disease, that I will know what to do because I have some form of education. Mm-hmm. Um, well, thank you for having me. No problem. And I also appreciate you shedding light on mental health because it's a big deal to me. Um, a huge deal to me. We as a community, we don't talk about mental health the way we, we should because it's still right. taboo. It's still something seen as a negative. Like having a therapist or going to a session, oh, you must be crazy. Mm-hmm. And it's like, we're human. 
We've right. dealt with so much. Mm-hmm. Who out of us isn't crazy. Right. We've yeah, all absolutely. been dealing with life, and life mm-hmm. will throw everything at you death, grief, depression. You it can't was, make right. your three bill payments. Um, that person you thought you loved, that cheated on you, like life. And all that happened in one day. Listen. <laughs> In one day, <laughs> all of it one day, in a three-hour span, mm-hmm. and life will be like, so what you gonna do now? And, and it keeps going, and it will keep going. It will keep going, it and you're expected you to keep going. And, and I you're like, but no, I have to deal with X, Y, and Z. Yeah, and yeah. I think that that um, misconception about the black woman that we're so strong, we're so dependent, mm-hmm. we, that is hurting us mm-hmm. as we get older. Because right. yes, we are strong. Yes, you can depend on us, but mm-hmm. we are also human. Right. We are fragile. We are soft. Absolutely. We need help. We mm-hmm. need to be able to depend on you as well. Mm-hmm. So when a black woman says, I need to go see a therapist, I need to talk to somebody, I'm dealing with some real issues, we get looked at as if we just cursed out somebody's mom. It makes people uncomfortable. And you know, it shouldn't. Yeah. It, it if, should. I'm, if I'm working towards a better me so that I can be better friend to you or a better daughter or a better to spouse to live another day to What's live another day issue right yeah right and so mm-hmm. i'm glad that, that you talked about that and what i've seen on tv is um black people or i know when insecure molly goes to therapy mm-hmm. she sees the therapy and i know Charlamagne the guy he talks about how he goes to therapy on a weekly basis i know kendrick lamar was one of my Favorite Listen, artist. I love. Ah, girl, don't give me love. <laughs> don't give me I love Kendrick. I and love you know Kendrick. What? Uh-huh. I think the more people who have those public stances, who have right. such a big following, if mm-hmm. they say that it's okay to be yourself, mm-hmm. it's okay to not be okay. It's okay to it's talk okay about to be it. flawed. Yeah, it's okay to have these conversations. Mm-hmm. It's okay to learn as you go. Right. That we as a whole will feel more comfortable being who we are. Right. And I think. When we talk about therapy, we always think about the the horrible things that have happened in the past, dealing with black people and the institutions. Mm-hmm. And we didn't have access to those things. Right. We were often told, pray about it, because, you know, like you said earlier, the church was our only way of dealing with those mm-hmm. issues. But now that we have the access to do and things the resources, now, right. and the resources, right. and we have people that look like us mm-hmm. who understand what we're going through right. to help us, mm-hmm. it's different. So we should approach it differently. Right. And I think those conversations are vital because, like I said, I'm not only dealing with sickle cell disease mm-hmm. and depression, I'm also dealing with being black in America. Right. It's a lot. It's a lot. All at the same time. At the same time, every day, I'm alive. Mm-hmm. So I have to make sure that I'm okay within before I go outside in the world and venture out. Right. Because it will show up in the world. And it affects how you treat yes. others. Yes. And it affects your work relationships. Yes. It affects us. Yeah, it affects everyone around you. So, yes. thank you for sharing my own mental health and associating it with sickle cell. Because, I mean, if I had sat down and just gave it thought, then I would have been like, okay, well, I'm pretty sure they can be depressing at times. But yes. most people don't associate chronic illnesses with um, depression and anxiety because it will, the, the chronic pain and all of uh, the, the medical treatments and the hospital visits. Yes. Calling off from work, all of that yes. will affect your mental health. So I thank you for raising that point. I appreciate it. Thank really you for asking. Where can we follow you? Um, I'm on Facebook and Instagram and Twitter. Okay. Um, Facebook, it's Type of the Mormon, and okay. I'm basically just talking about what I'm doing. Um, it's some of my personal life, but it's okay. also me advocating for sickle cell, so it's a little bit of everything. Okay. Um, Instagram is more of my modeling. Um, life okay. Okay. <laughs> so I just leave Instagram for that and Twitter is a little bit of everything so I think as much as I talk progressively on Facebook mm-hmm. about dealing with this disease Twitter is like my okay let me just vent for a little while okay because there are posts where I'm talking about my depression okay there are posts where I'm talking about I'm sick of being in America and feeling like I'm nothing Mm-hmm. And there are posts where I'm like, man, sickle cell just doesn't get any love or respect. So it's a little bit of every aspect of okay. me. And this a Gemini cutie? 
Um, my Instagram is Gemini Cutie Pie. G- Gemini Cutie Pie. And then okay. on Twitter, it's it's Janelle. But I think that's right because okay. I haven't been on Twitter <laughs> okay. in such a, a it's been a minute. Um, mm-hmm. I need to become more active, but I think it's it's Janelle. Janelle. That's my handle, I believe. <laughs> Got it. Well, I appreciate you so much for educating us. And no we will be back together again for an insecure review. Yeah. Which is my favorite show. That's my show, yeah. <laughs> Listen. Right. I can relate to Issa so much. Where I'm like, Issa, are you yeah. me? Yes. Because I feel like I'm you. Right. In a different body. And there's moments where I really relate to mommy too. And I'm just like, mm. Mommy's this getting on my nerves. Like a black girl right. issue. Like, we are just all of us. Especially with relationships. Yes, and Still finding your way in your 30s. Because yes. in your 20s, that's when you're supposedly, you're supposed to figure everything out. So you'll be establishing your 30s. And but then you know what? The 20s some, yeah. isn't really for that. Your 20s mm-hmm. is for fun. Your 20s mm-hmm. is to go out and get an education and have fun. Your 30s is about working out who you are as right. an adult mm-hmm. and still marking your path. And I think we have to define who we are instead of right. the world telling us, well, mm-hmm. you know, you're 22, you better right. be working on this. And it's like, who says? Right. And being 33 and female, I'm looked at crazy because I don't have a husband and kids. So it's like, well, <laughs> how do you know that a husband and kids are going to be fulfilling for me at this point in my life? Right. Oh, how do you know that's what I want? How do you know that that's what I'm meant to do? Right. I wasn't put on earth just to procreate. I was put here right. for mm-hmm. other reasons. That right. may not be my purpose. So I think a lot of times I get defensive, especially if it's a man telling me, you know, you better get on having some kids. And it's like, right. are you trying to have kids with me, sir? Right. Why do you care? Right. It does me being single and not mm-hmm. having kids and the drama that comes with that situation, the same way right. you're in, make you mad? Right. So yeah, I have some issues about that. Yeah, it, it gets crazy. So be looking for that review. Yes. And Issa, and I guess what's so, um, what draws me to the show so much is it's realistic. Yeah. Because you have Molly, who's, um, well into her career and thriving. Yes. So doing doing the things. This season she season. tripping a little bit, but for the most part, she's found out what she wants to do. And yes. this of this season, it's just like, well, what do I want to do? Yeah. So, but in your thirties, that can't happen. I'm a living witness. I know. So Listen, you and I are both. Good. <laughs> Y'all I'm both still trying to video. figure out what I'm doing. Right. <laughs> I, every day, every day, I question: Am I supposed to be doing? Maybe right. I should try something else. And I'm like, right. should I still be thinking about trying something else in my thirties? Like, should I just? That's the perfect time. Should I just know what I should be doing? No, you don't have to know. The right. people who do know, great. They probably had a plan set out, mm-hmm. but we all don't have that same plan. We all haven't had those same experiences. So we have to look at ourselves and what we truly want in life. Are you going to be happy career-wise? Are you going to be happy in your social life? Are you going to be happy spiritually? And if mm-hmm. you're not, go do things that make you happy. And I have to learn that personally that mm-hmm. the things that other people want from me mm-hmm. don't necessarily have to be what I do. Okay. And we have to be and okay with it. We have to be okay with it. We have to be okay with it. And we have to be okay with um, the people in your life that is not um, supportive. And that's where I am. I'm yeah. still learning that lesson. M- me too. It's a hard one too. And it is hard. I, I value my friendships and so you know much. What? I value my friends more so than family because these people have chosen to love me in spite of who mm-hmm. I am. They're not looking they have to. obligatory. You know, like, hey, you're family, so I kind of have to do these things for you. No, they choose to mm-hmm. be there. So. I treasure my friends so much more because of that. Mm. But at the same time, when I don't have their support, especially dealing with sickle cell disease, dealing mm-hmm. with awareness, or mm-hmm. hey, there's a 5K walk coming up, can you guys come? Mm-hmm. And I don't get any support, it really hits me. And I'm just kind of like, what do I have to do? I beg on social media, I plead. Right. I've been to every wedding, every mm-hmm. baby shower, every anniversary celebration dinner mm-hmm. to support my friends and family. Right. But when it comes back to me receiving that support, I get nothing. So I'm still learning that lesson that it's okay if they don't see the passion that I see. Okay. Because they don't have my vision. They don't look at it from my eyes. And like you said, if you're not affected by something, you don't 
um, understand. Yeah, it's not in the <laughs> forefront. Right, it's not in the forefront, and you don't understand how it affects your life. Um, right. Understanding is key again. So oh, yeah, that's that's just something I'm learning. It's it's a hard lesson, like you said. It's very difficult to understand. Painful. Yes. And you in your thirties with growing pains, it's like what? Yes. This is what <laughs> we are in the growing pain. Yes. My thirties, <laughs> especially thirty three. Yeah. My birthday's in January, so we're in September. Yeah. So I still got a little ways to go to my birthday, but thirty three has been. Yeah so rough yes. but i'm so grateful <laughs> i'm so grateful because it's made me a stronger individual mm -hmm. and it's brought some amazing people out in my life and yes i've learned to be strong enough to let people go and i think that's something that i'm dealing with now that as much as i want these people in my life they may not feel the same and that's okay mm -hmm. it's dealing with the rejection so that's where I am. And like I said, it's growing pain. So mm -hmm. it's like, okay, I love this person, but how do I face this? How do I handle it? Mm -hmm. So that's where I'm at too. So yeah, it's, it's rough. Well, shout out to <laughs> Right? <laughs> Y'all, thumbs up this video. We're going to stop right here because the camera cut off on us earlier. Yeah, we were did. talking and we didn't know. And we thought it was over. So we're yeah. going to end it here. I think this is a good um, stop and point song. Make sure y'all follow us on Instagram and on, I'll put our information below. So make sure y'all follow us, thumbs up this video, subscribe to my channel if you have not already, and be on the lookout for our Insecure Review. I'm not sure if it'll be episode five or six. Hopefully it's more than eight episodes, but I'll see y'all later. Bye, bye.